Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our service here in Eglis this Sunday morning. Good to see you. It's good to be able to gather and worship the Lord together. As we begin, I want to read just a couple of verses from Revelation chapter 19. We read this. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him both small and great. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood. power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you that it's in Christ, the Lamb of God, that we can come to you today. That it's in Christ, the, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, that we can approach you as our Father. And we come to you this morning with thanks, Lord. Thanking you for how in Christ you've given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. For how in him you chose us before the world was made to be your holy people, without fault in your sight. For how in him you adopted us as your children, 
And how in him you've set us free by his blood. And how you have forgiven our sins. We thank you for how, as we thought about last week, you've given us your Holy Spirit, the sign and pledge of our inheritance. And for this, Lord, we give you the praise and the glory. But not only do we come in thanks and praise today, but we also come in confession. And even as we do so, it grieves us that we continue to fall short of your glory, that we can so easily go through our days living our way And not yours. That we can so easily fail to love you. With our heart, soul, mind and strength. And our neighbour as ourselves. Lord we ask that in your mercy you would, would reveal our sin to us. That you would trouble our souls about it. And bring it into your light. Give us no rest until our sin has been dealt with by the cross. Lord, as we come in confession, we thank you that we can do so, knowing the wonderful words of truth that everyone who believes in Christ receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Lord, we thank you that it's in Christ that we receive that forgiveness. In Christ that we receive your mercy. And as we continue, merciful Father, in this time of worship, we pray that you enable us by your Spirit to give you the worship that you deserve. Help us to be completely open to you, open to your good influence, open to your transforming grace. Continue the good work you've begun in each one of your people. Break our desire to sin and make us eager to do what is good. Praying that in all things you'd be honoured and glorified. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We turn now to a reading from God's Word and we continue our studies in the book of Ephesians. So we'll turn there, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. And you can find it on page 1173. So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, let us hear the word of God. Paul writes, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the, heaven, in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, in every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. We thank the Lord for this reading of his word. Before we uh, study that passage together, we're going to stand together and sing again what's a paraphrase of Micah chapter 7, I'll watch in hope for God. In hope for God, my Savior and my Lord, 
Though evil seems to reign, I'll trust His constant word. I shall not fear, though friends betray. In faith I'll pray, my God shall hear. Although I often fall, My God shall raise me up, the Lord will be my light. Through my distress, he'll plead for me, and I shall see his righteousness. The Lord will put to shame the mockers I know boast. God's kingdom shall extend, expand from coast to coast. From every shore they'll come to sing of Israel's King forevermore. Shepherd your flock, O oh God, and nourish us once more. Reveal your wondrous acts as you revealed before. Your enemies shall see your power and trembling call upon There is no God like you who pardons and forgives, whose anger does not last, whose mercy ever lives. We can be sure on history's page through Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we, as, as we've just sung together, your word does endure. That we have it and are able to read it. And that it's through your word that you speak to us. So as we come to you now, we ask that just as Paul prayed for the Ephesians, that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened. We pray the same for ourselves that you would help us not just to grow in knowledge about you, but that we would come to know you better and grow in love for you through Christ our Lord. Amen. It's been said that knowledge has a beginning, but no end. That knowledge has a beginning, but no end. And our passage, passage today deals with the subject of knowledge. And in particular, what Paul is speaking about is the knowledge that the Ephesians need to have if they're to mature in faith. But more than that, it's the knowledge they need to have if they're not just to survive in the hostile environment in which they find themselves, but thrive as a church. There are people who stood against the prevailing idolatry of their day and are now coming up against persecution. That was their situation. And it's into the midst of this that Paul prays for them. It's one of two main sections of prayer in the book of Ephesians. The other one comes at the end of chapter 3. And both the sections start with these three words for this reason. So in other words, in light of what I've just said, this is what I do. This is what I pray. And he tells them two things he prays for them. He prays, first of all, giving thanks for them, giving thanks for them as a church, giving thanks for the evidences of, of God's work amongst them, for 
their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love for uh, all God's people, for the saints. And also he gives thanks. In fact, he says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. So Paul is encouraged by the reports he hears, and he can't stop, and he doesn't stop giving thanks for them. But more than that, he asks. And that's what I want to focus our thoughts on today. What it is that he asks for them. What it is that he prays for them. That they would thrive and flourish. That they would be strengthened in their living for God and in the midst of the antagonism that they face as believers. So last week and the week before we've looked at the spiritual blessings God's poured out upon them. And last week in particular we thought about their spiritual inheritance in Christ. And so Paul prays for this reason, for that spiritual inheritance, for those blessings poured out in you. I pray these things for you. I give thanks and I pray that God would bless you. And two things he prays, that they would know God better and that they would know what they have in God. Two things that Paul prays for the church then and two things we would do well to pray for our brothers and sisters in the church today. Two requests for them to grow in knowledge, a knowledge that has a beginning but no end. So firstly, he prays that they would know God. Uh, and maybe I've shared a story in the past about a time when I was in Glasgow and our church there were running a discipleship explored course. And so one of the ladies in the church invited another lady to come along to the course only to receive the reply, why would I want to go to a course like that. I've been coming to this church for 70 years. What more could I possibly learn about Christianity? You see, she didn't know what Paul knows here. And that's that we worship a God who is infinite. A God who, we, who there's always more to know. Oh, there's always more of God that we can know. Paul knew this. And that's why he prays for the Ephesians that they would know God better. Now remember here, he's writing to the church. He's writing to those who know Christ, who know God already through Christ. Many of them who came to faith in his time ministering there. So he knows that they're believers. He knows that they've come to faith. But his prayer is not just that they would know God, but that they would know him better. Verse 17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you, would, so that you may know him better. He's praying for a work of the spirit in their lives, in their hearts, that they would come to know God more. As I've said, the Ephesians know God already. Time and again, we've seen it. Time and again, we've read how they are in Christ, that they've believed, and as, as we read last week, they've been marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. They know God, they've come to faith, they, they know him. But Paul says, to use the words of Frank Carson, come here, there's more. He says, you can know God better. I can know God better. And because God is an infinite God, we can always know him better. And so Paul prays, keeps on praying this for the Ephesians. You know, you could memorize every word in that book, and yet there'd always be more about God that the Spirit could reveal. A deeper depth to the words, a deeper reality to the words, a deeper experience of who God is. And Paul prays this for the Ephesians that the words in this page about who God is would become an ever greater and deeper and wonderful reality for these Ephesians, that they would know him better. He prays it for the Ephesians, but also it's something he desires for himself. We see that when he writes to the Philippians, when he says, I, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. And of course, Paul knows Christ already. He's served him. He's planted churches. He had the amazing conversion experience on the road to Damascus. Paul knows Christ. But he's saying, I want to know him better. I want to know him more. 
there's so much more of the Lord and I want to know him more. And he's praying this for the Ephesians, that they would have the same desire, the same experience of knowing God better. The Puritans, who were theologians of centuries past, they used to speak about experiential theology. In other words, where the doctrines of God's of God and His Word became more real to us in our experience. That the truth in these pages moved from our heads to our hearts and became ever more real there. And Paul is praying this for the Ephesians, that the doctrines of God in this word become more real to them. He's saying to the Ephesians and to us and to himself, we can know him better. He's saying, I want to know him better. And I'm praying for that for you too. Now, I understand here he wasn't saying this to scold them or to beat them down in some way. He wasn't saying it to, or praying it to say, you should know him better. But he's praying it because his desire, his loving desire for them was that they know him better. He knew their situation. He knew that they were quite likely being marginalized, being ostracized for their faith. He knew that times wouldn't be easy for them. He knew their needs were great. But in the midst of those needs, in the midst of those challenges, what does he see as the answer? Well, that they know the God of all grace and goodness and love and mercy and holiness better. He prays that they know God better. But he doesn't stop there. He keeps on praying. He prays then in verses 18 and 19 that they would know what they have in God and what we have in God, knowing what we have in God. During the years of the Great Depression in America, there was a man by the name of Ira Yates who, used to, who owned a, a large amount of land in Texas. He raised sheep in the land, but the sheep were no longer paying the bills. And it got to the point that he barely had enough money for food or clothing for himself or his family and looked as if he was going to have to sell up. But one day, then there was an oil worker approached him and said, Mr. Yates, we believe there may be oil on your land. Will you let us drill on it? And Yates thought, at this stage, if nothing to lose, why not? On you go. So they started drilling. 500 feet, nothing. 700 feet, nothing. 1,000 feet, still nothing. Until they drilled down to 1,100 feet, and they discovered the largest deposit of oil that up to that point had ever been discovered in North America. 80,000 barrels of oil were produced from it per day, and overnight Yates became a billionaire. But actually, though, Yates had always been a billionaire, just he didn't know it. He'd always had that oil there, that wealth there, but he didn't know it. And Paul here is saying to the Ephesians, you have all this wealth here, all this blessing poured out in you, and I want you to know it. I want you to know all these blessings that God has given you. I want you to know the riches that are yours in Christ. You know, last week we read about our inheritance, our inheritance as believers. And Paul prays here about the inheritance for the Christians, that they know it, that they appreciate it. Paul has laid out the glorious blessings of God in verses 3 to 14, the, the glorious graces of God. And he prays that they would know them, that they would appreciate them, that they would take hold of them. He wants them to know that they have a, a treasure chest of God's blessing sitting there. And there's no point the treasure chest just sitting there locked but he wants them to plunder the treasure. He wants them to take hold of these blessings. He wants them to appreciate the blessings 
that are theirs and ours in Christ. And so he prays three things for them, that they would know the hope to which God has called us, then they would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and thirdly, his incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, I want to think about the power aspect next week, but this morning I want to think about the other two, the hope to which he's called us and the riches of his glorious inheritance. The hope. The Ephesians had grown up in something of a hopeless culture. Chapter 2 underlines this in verse 12 where we read that they were, they, were, they were without hope and without God in the world. You see, the local religion, the local idolatry, the worship of Artemis was a, a hopeless religion. And the future was seen as little other than, than a closed door with no future behind it. And the funerals of those who worshipped Artemis would have been little other than hopeless affairs. Maybe they would have been thankful for what was past, but there was nothing to point forward to, nothing to take hold of for the future. A bit like an atheist funeral where the people are told there's nothing beyond this, there's no hope, there's no future. That was what the Ephesians grew up with, but that was the before, whereas they're living in the now. And in the now, there's hope. There's hope for them. And it's not a wishful kind of hope, but it's, a, it's an assurance of the reality that's there, assurance of the future reality. Now, you might well wonder why Paul chooses to pray for hope for them in particular. Why hope? Well, it's because the way we think about our eternal future changes the way we live now in the today, in the present. Because for the Christian knowing that there is an eternity with the Lord, encourage us, encourages us to live in light of the truth of that and to point others to the, this wonderful truth. He prays they would know the hope, but also then he prays that they would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, the riches of his glorious inheritance. Now, at first, this may, might seem like little other than an alternative way to speak of the future, but it's not. You see, in verse 14, Paul had spoken of our inheritance, the inheritance that's ours in Christ. But here, you'll notice it's different because he doesn't speak about our inheritance, but he speaks about God's inheritance, his glorious inheritance. What is God's glorious inheritance? Well, in the Old Testament, it was his people. Psalm 33, for example, we read, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. And just as in the Old Testament, God's people were his inheritance, it's the same today. And so when God prays that to the eyes of, of their hearts would be enlightened, that they would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, He's praying that they would understand the significance of being a part of the church, that they would understand the significance of what it means to be a part of God's people, his new creation. He's praying that we would understand the, and take hold of the wonder it is to be a part of the church. You know, we can maybe look around on a Sunday and take the whole thing for granted. We can maybe look around us and just see a group of people from the area who meet together for worship week by week. But Paul is praying that we see the, the spiritual reality here. He's praying that we would see that not just that we're a people in here, but that we are a part of a church who gather week by week and day by day all around the world. Not just today, but in many centuries past, and who will keep gathering in Jesus' name until the day comes again until that day when he gathers, gathers us all together, a huge gathering, worshipping the Lord together, the Lord's glorious inheritance. Think for a moment about the impact and the importance this would have had for the Ephesians. See, many of them, we can see in the book of Acts, had a background in sorcery. A number of them would have been amongst the wealthy 
book owners of the city, those who had burnt their scrolls when they turned to Christ. Scrolls which were worth hundreds of thousands of pounds, if, if not more. They had given up all that money, all that inheritance, as a mark of repentance, as a mark of turning to Christ and turning away from their sorcery. But in doing that, all that money was gone, all that financial security was gone. Perhaps for some of them, their families disowned them, and that was gone as well. So when saying here, and speaking of God's glorious inheritance, Paul is, praying, Paul is saying to the Ephesians, you're now a part of God's family. You're now a part of his inheritance. That you're his and he is yours. You're God's for eternity. Think of the blessing that would have brought to those believers then. Think of the encouragement that would have brought. Perhaps they were feeling small and insignificant. Maybe they were wondering, have we done the right thing? And Paul says, absolutely yes. A thousand times yes, you've done the right thing in turning to Christ. You're his now. You're a part of his family. You're a part of his family for eternity. God is yours and you are his. You're his glorious inheritance. Paul is praying that they would know who they are in God and they would know the reality of the blessings that are theirs in him. But as we finish, what are we to take home from this today? Well, I think there's two or three things to take home with us. Firstly, the fact that Paul prays that they would know God better is a reminder that first of all, with the blessing of being able to know God for ourselves. That we can know God in the same way that the Ephesians came to know God, the same way that they came to be in Christ. By turning from our sins and putting our faith in Christ and giving our lives to him. That's what the Ephesians did and what each of us is called to do. That we can come to know God for ourselves through, through coming to him through Christ. We need to do that. The Bible is clear, immensely clear. We need to take that step of coming to God through faith in Christ and repenting of our sins. We can see that. We can know God. But secondly, we see that we can know God better. We can know God better. You see, the Christian faith isn't just about reaching a line of having your sins forgiven and then leaving it at that. But Paul is saying, you can come to know God for yourself. And you can come to know God better and better and better. Because, because of his grace to you, because of his mercy to you, because of his spirit opening up his word to you. He is saying, there's always more with the Lord. Always more of his infinite greatness for us to take hold of. Always more of of the reality of God in our lives for us to appreciate and experience. He's saying, hunger and thirst for the Lord and pray that you would know him better. And that takes us to the final thing for us to take home today. Because what we see this passage is, is also a prompt for prayer. But more than a prompt to prayer, it's maybe a, a call for us to refocus our prayers, perhaps. I, I know for me, that was the challenge I took. If we look at our Bibles, other than the Lord Jesus, there's perhaps no one's, no one's prayers who give us a better example, maybe other than David, than Paul's. Paul gives us prayers we can follow. And we see a flavor of it here that he prays for thanks for his fellow Christians and also prays for their spiritual growth, their spiritual blessing. And I wonder when you last prayed that for yourself or when you last prayed it for those around us here in the congregation or maybe the wider church as a whole. When did you last pray that you would come to know God more? When you, that you would come to appreciate God's blessings more? experience them more. 
Paul knew what the Ephesians were going through. He knew the trials they faced. He knew that life was tough for them, that day-to-day things weren't good. But as a means of blessing them, as a means of helping them with those trials, he chose to pray for them. He chose to give thanks for them. And he chose that in the midst of all that, that they would know God better. In all that life throws at us, in all the challenges we face in our day, may we know God better. May we hunger more for him and grow to come to a deeper experience of him and reality of him in our lives. Let's pray. <coughs> Loving Father, we thank you that in Christ we can come to know you. In Christ we can come to know the forgiveness of sins. We can come to know you as our God. But we thank you that because you are an infinite God, you are a great God, you are the God who is from everlasting to everlasting, we thank you that we can come to know you better. And we pray that for ourselves, that just as Paul prayed it for the Ephesians, we pray for it as our, for, we pray it for ourselves as a church today, that we would come to know you better, that we would come to know you in a deeper way, a greater way, that we would come to love you more, that the words on the page of Scripture of who you are would become a greater reality to us in our lives. We thank you for your word to us today. We pray you'd bless it to us. We pray, Lord, you'd help us to take hold of the blessings that are ours in Christ. Lord, we pray you'd bless your word to us today, that you would uh, impact our hearts with it, our lives with it, and that you would uh, draw us closer to yourself in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> As we come now to our prayers for others, we're going to watch a video now which speaks of the Cochrane family uh, uh, who minister in Portugal. Uh, and who are missionaries to the Presbyterian Church. So we'll watch that now. Hola. We really appreciate you taking some time out to find out what God has been doing through the ministry of Comunidade Pedras Vivas, or CPV for short, in Porto, Portugal. So come into the month of August, we're very thankful for an encouraging first session of the small group ministry. We completed the book of Galatians and it was great to see how each group met regularly over the past number of months to apply an understanding of the gospel to their lives. We're very thankful for how the leaders have grown in their ability to lead the groups and also how fellowship has developed beyond the formal fortnightly meetings with members of each group supporting each other and looking out for each other. We're currently planning and putting together the final details of the next session of the small groups which will run from September to December and we will be looking at what it means to love your church. The development of the small group ministry is an integral part of the vision of Comunidade Pedras Vivas. We have always encouraged those who are followers of Jesus to learn how to live their lives as disciples of Jesus beyond the walls of the church because this is where we will have the greatest impact in the Portuguese society. Pray for our members as they share Jesus with their friends in natural ways, as they go about their daily lives in their workplaces and schools, in their homes and in their neighbourhoods. The CPV church plant began in 2013. And like any church plant, it has gone through different stages. It's hard for us sometimes to remember the early days when we started as just two families here in Porto. God has been faithful and especially during the past two years we've been very blessed with significant numerical growth. Just Easter this year we received new members bringing our membership to approximately 60 people. It's now time for the CPB church plant to enter another new phase as we seek to organise the church and appoint local leadership. Pray with us in the next few months as we prepare and train elders and as CPV becomes a recognised church of our partner denomination, the Christian Presbyterian Church of Portugal. We're thankful for good numbers every Sunday morning. 
The service format combining expository preaching, worship songs, prayers and teaching of the new catechism is meeting a need amongst many people. We are aware of more people engaging with CPV online and we welcome visitors most weeks. Many of these visitors are Brazilians who want to grow deeper in their faith and be active in a local church. However, in recent weeks we have been encouraged by the visit of some Portuguese. Please pray for the weekly services that people would grow in their faith and understanding or come to know for the first time who God is, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. With the increased number of parents with young children in CPV, we've been praying for some time about starting a programme that would enable CPV parents to reach out to other parents with young children. The idea would be to provide a space for the children to play together and give parents the opportunity to get to know one another over some light refreshment. We sense that now is the time to launch this outreach activity. Please pray for the planning going into this and for the development of this ministry in the autumn season. Thank you once again for your faithful prayers and support for all of the ministry taking place through CPV. We firmly believe that prayer is a key aspect for all that is happening in Portugal and we want to encourage you that your prayers are making a massive difference to the cause of gospel ministry in this part of the world. We also are praying for your witness as you faithfully serve God in parts of Ireland, north, south, east and west, or further afield. So let's pray for the Cochrans and about our own needs here as a congregation. Let's pray. Loving and gracious Father, we thank you that you give us the privilege of praying for others. So just as Paul was able to pray for the church in Ephesus, that we are able to pray for the church in Portugal. And we thank you for the church that's been established there and the work that James and Heather Cochran have done as part of that. And we pray for your continued blessing upon them. We thank you for those who have been a part of that church and for the new, the new members they've seen in recent years. Uh, we thank you for all those who've come, uh, Brazilian immigrants, but also recently, Lord, for those Portuguese who've come to the congregation as well. And we pray that uh, you'd continue to bless them. We thank you for the children who are there. And we ask for your hand upon that congregation and upon the ministry there. We pray for them. We, we thank you for the, the small groups that have started. And we pr give thanks for the growth in those groups. And we pray, Lord, for the training and preparation of, of leaders and elders there, and that you would lead the congregation uh, to, to those whom you have called. Lord, as, just as we pray for uh, the, the church in Portugal, we also pray for our congregation here in Eglish, and we pray for your blessing upon us. We have already prayed for spiritual growth amongst us, and we pray for your hand of of blessing to be upon us um, in your mercy. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be a church that looks to you, a church that's trusting in you and coming to you in prayer. Lord, and as we pray, we pray for the Weir family uh, as they uh, grieve the, the death of, of Margaret. We pray you would surround them with your love and with your care and that they would know your hand upon them. We also pray for those who are unwell at this time and we, we think of those in hospital. And we pray you'd bless them that even now that they would know your presence and your healing hand upon them. We thank you also for the Sunday school as they join us and, and pray. Thank you for the leaders. Thank you for the teachers and their work uh, and the, the boys and girls and pray that you'd bless them and help them to grow in their understanding of the good news of the Lord Jesus just as we pray that for ourselves as well, that week by week, as we come to your word, that you would teach us and bless us and lead us closer to yourself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, everyone. Come on in.
Okay, just a few announcements I want to bring to your attention. First of all, to say that the midweek Bible study and prayer meeting is in Eglish this week, so it's Wednesday at 8 o'clock in the, the church hall, the Bible study and prayer, and we very much encourage you, as always, to join us for that. And then I also want to mention um, a youth event that's happening in a few weeks. This is on Saturday the 29th, and it's for all children of secondary school age. It's a Presbyterian church event being held in Carn Money, and we'll be leaving at 5.45 to come back at 10.30. And for further information or to book a ticket, which is five pounds, please speak to myself or Owen. And then there's an announcement here for the PW, and I'll just read it as it is, probably the easiest thing. So Bally Albany and, and Glennon PW would like to extend an invitation to their annual box opening visitors' night on Monday the 10th of October, so tomorrow week, um, which will be at 8 p.m., God willing, in the Murdoch Hall at Bally Albany. Their speaker for the evening is Dr. Carl Watson, who's a psychiatric doctor, and she will speak on anxiety from a professional and Christian perspective. So we've been asked to pass this invitation on. So any ladies who are interested in that, um, I think if you speak to Heather Irwin, um, there'll be hopefully a few people going down to that in Bally Albany tomorrow night week at 8 p.m. Um, so for PW. And finally, just to say a reminder, um, the Impact Week of events, which are all invited to Castle Caulfield. So it starts in two weeks, and if you want a flyer, there are still some on the table there about the various events and that are happening that week. So you're very much encouraged. Uh, and George Newell, who will be speaking at some of those, will be leading our, leading our morning service here in two weeks. Um, on the 16th. So I think they're all the announcements for today. 401 comes to bring our children's talk. We're going to stand and sing together. God is so good. God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. He took my sin, He took my sin, He took my sin, He's so good to me. Now I am free. Now I am free, now I am free, He's so good to me. God is so good, He took my sin, now I am free, He's so good to me. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and boys and girls, and especially, if I could speak this morning, that would be great. Uh, but it is so good to be here. Um, today, we're going to be thinking of another meal that Jesus had. Um, this is a series that we started uh, before the summer, uh, so we're going to be picking that up uh, once again throughout the, uh, between now and Christmas. So... Luke 14, 1 to 6, tells us of an encounter that Jesus had. It was a meal that Jesus was invited to, uh, one Sabbath. Um, boys and girls, can anyone one of you tell me, what do we mean by the Sabbath? Anyone fancy a go? Connie? A Sunday. Yes, we do um, hold the Sabbath as a Sunday here now, uh, post Christ's uh, resurrection uh, and ascension. Um, that was something that was introduced by the early church um, in the first century. Um, back at this time in particular, um, it was actually a Saturday. Um, and it was the day that was commanded um, back in uh, Genesis uh, that God, after his creation, told Adam and Eve, this is a holy day. This is the day for you to rest. You have 
six days to work, do all your work, and today is a holy day um, that you are to take that rest. And, and it's repeated again in Exodus, um, at the given the Ten Commandments. It's repeated, repeated in Leviticus. Uh, it's also repeated in Deuteronomy and Joshua as well. Where this law um, and the Torah uh, is given to the Israelites, God's chosen people, to take this day of rest. Now, Jesus is at this Pharisee's house, and whenever he comes in, it kind of seems as if he's been set up. Everybody is watching him. They're keeping a close eye and sit to see what is Jesus going to do. But what are they watching for? Well, we're told then there's a man there with swollen arms and swollen legs. Now, I know a bit of what this is like. Uh, to have swollen hands and legs is really stiff. It can be sore, it can be painful, and it can be absolutely excruciating pain. It can probably do some things, but it likes to picking up things. It would be really difficult. It likes to walk in, it would be really sore, probably not able to do long distances. So this man is not, ha- is not comfortable. He's not happy. And Jesus asks the religious people, because he knows what they're thinking. And he says to them, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? And, he's, and they don't answer him. They don't say a word. Jesus goes over, he places his hands on this man with uh, the swollen joints, and, uh, and, he, and he's healed instantly. And then Jesus sends him on his way again. And then he turns to the, the Pharisees and says, well, would, if you, you saw your son or your, your livestock and they've fallen into this pit, would you not hurry over, rush over and help them out and get them to safety? He also says to them, do you yourselves not work on a Sabbath in the temple? The same way as do me and Mark and the guys in the sound desk and uh, uh, the, whoever is on doing music, um, uh, do they not work on a Sabbath? Obviously, the answer is yes, they do, and they would. But still, they didn't answer. They didn't want to give Jesus the satisfaction of actually having proved something to them and have taught them a lesson. So what is Jesus trying to teach us today? What is the lesson for all of us and you guys in in particular? Well, is he saying that the Sabbath doesn't matter anymore? It's a, it's a rule that was for then, it's not for us now. Not at all. Not at all. That's not what Jesus is saying. Because he healed this man, not because the law says that you must rest and you can't do anything. The law doesn't end there. It says to honour the Lord your God. And what would have brought honour to God in this situation? Would it have been to let this man suffer? And by that we mean to do what the religious people were saying. They're saying, well, we must do rest, we must do nothing. Let that man suffer. Or would it be more honouring to God to heal him, to make him well, to show that God loves and cares for him so much so that he didn't want him to suffer anymore? What brought more honour to God? Well, Obviously, it's healing the man. It's healing and doing good in the eyes of God. You see, we're not called to live religiously. And by religiously, I mean living life as the, here's a set of laws that we must keep. And if we keep all these laws, well, then we can be right with God. Or here's a ritual of the, if we perform this over and over and over again, that's going to make us right with God. That's not how we are to live. Despite what lots of people think, that's not what Christianity is all about. Christianity is fun. It's relational. It's going day by day, living alongside God, learning what our life is to show to to others, to those we meet, and how we can live faithfully for him. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. So, it's a life of freedom. So it doesn't matter today or the decisions you make. Of course it does. But how do you make those decisions? 
this decision of does this make bring honor to God? Um, I used this example earlier. If, if, if it's time, the school bell's rung, and your friend falls, gets hurt, and they can't walk. Do you go over, help them up, and take them in and say, look, my friend's got hurt? Or do you say, oh, wait a minute, the rules are that I have to be in within five minutes of this bell ringing. Sorry, little Johnny, I'm away here. Of course not. You would pick him up. You would help him into school, regardless of what the rules said, because that's the right thing to do. And it's how we as Christians can show that we care for them and how we can bring honor to God. That's only one example. I know in your day-to-day lives, you'll come up against so many different other questions and challenges that you have to decide. But make the first question you answer in that is, what, what in this situation will bring more glory to God? Okay, thank you so much for listening. Uh, Let's just close our eyes, bow our heads, and let's pray to God. Let's do that now. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you uh, for this example that Jesus has given to us today. An example of what it is to not be bound by the law, but to do what is right in your eyes, to do what is honoring in your name. Lord, we know that you gave us the law to show us how to best live life. But Lord, we know that we are free from it, that you have um, sent your son to pay the price that we could never pay, to show love that we can never show without you. So Lord, be with us now. Lord, we pray that you continue to be with us the rest of today and look after us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Owen. We're now going to stand to sing our closing hymn. Um, Our passage today spoke about knowing the hope that's ours in Christ. And we're going to sing, There is a hope that stands, the hope that burns within my heart. There is a hope that burns within my heart That gives me strength for every passing day A glimpse of glory now revealed in meager part Yet drives all doubt away I stand in Christ with sins forgiven and Christ in me, the hope of him. My heart is calling and my deepest joy to make his will my home. There is a hope that lifts my weary head, a consolation strong against despair, that when the world has plunged me in its deepest pit, I find the Saviour there. Through present sufferings, future fear, He whispers courage in my ear, for I am safe in everlasting arms. And they will lead me home There is a hope that stands the test of time That lifts my eyes beyond the beckoning grave To see the matchless beauty of the day divine When I behold his face When suffering cease and sorrows die And every longing satisfied Then joy unspeakable will flood my soul There I am truly home 
We finish with these words of blessing from 1 Peter chapter 4. May the God of grace make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen.